Comics Golden Age and Silver Age artist, talks about his favorite series at DC, The Atomic Knights, featured in Strange Adventures. Uh, I enjoyed very much working on The Atomic Knights, which was a series, an ongoing series of Strange Adventures, uh, having to do with uh, uh, post-World War III uh, after an atomic war. Uh, these were uh, characters who were not, uh, suits of armor that uh, were impervious to radiation, so they could go under highly radioactive situations uh, wearing these suits of armor and per perform their, their heroic deeds. One of the hottest young artists today is Joe Casada. The, that's the whole theme behind Ninjak right now. It's the whole artistic theme between Art Nouveau playing against Art Deco, you know, and, and, and I'm using it as a good versus evil kind of thing. The concept behind Ninjak is imagine taking James Bond, Bruce Lee, and Batman, and smashing them all into one person. And you pretty much get Ninjak. It's, it's you know, that, that uh, international intrigue, spy kind of thing with, uh, with the real, like, you know, martial arts kind of edge and high tech weaponry and, you know, it's, it's a pretty basic concept, but uh, it's got a few different twists on it. The most popular comics artist in 1993 is Todd McFarlane of Image Comics. Todd says what he likes about comic books. I, I, I found the comic books kind of gave me my youth back. And one of the things that I like about comic books is that, is that they have a tendency to keep you young. And by hanging around the kids, you, you stay young. I hope that I don't actually do too many adult comic books, quote unquote, because the kids come up to you with a glow on their face and they never talk about, you know, politics or religion and they're always like, wow, wow, wow. And it keeps you personally happy, I think. A multitude of sessions and conferences are held at the conventions. This particular session is a reunion of artists, writers, and editors from what is known as the golden age of comics, the 1940s and early 1950s. Attending the reunion are such notables as Sheldon Maldoff, Artist on the Golden Age Hawkman, Batman, Flash, and Green Lantern. Murphy Anderson, artist on Adam Strange, the Silver Age Hawkman, and the Atomic Knights. Russ Heath, realistic war comics artist on such series as Sergeant Rock. Dan Barry, artist on the Gangbusters comic series and the Flash Gordon comic strip. Paul Norris, Aquaman and Jungle Jim artist. Martin Nodell, creator of Green Lantern in 1940. Dick Sprang, Golden Age Superman and Batman artist. Gil Kane, artist at DC Comics on Green Lantern, Flash, and The Atom, plus Marvel Comics artist on Spider-Man, Conan, and many other titles. Vincent Sullivan, an early editor at DC Comics. He introduced Superman to the world in 1938 and Batman in 1939. Julius Schwartz, former editor at DC Comics, is considered by many to be responsible for launching what has come to be known as the Silver Age of comic books, starting with the reintroduction of Flash in 1956. Schwartz talks about his days as editor at DC. Legend has it that I started the Silver Age, only I didn't know it. Not only didn't I know it, I didn't know there was going to be a Silver Age. Because the Silver Age is only a Silver Age or any other age after it's over. I was involved in the Golden Age of comics, but I didn't know I was in the Golden Age. What had happened is, after four or five years in which superheroes did not appear, except for Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, we, or maybe I decided, we put out Flash again, which is a comic I edited back in the 40s. Now, the lucky thing I did was not to put the same Flash out again, but to reinvent the Flash. It means everything about the Flash would be different except the fact that he had super speed. He had a new costume, we had a new origin, a new city, a, a new cast of characters. Everything was different except the fact that he had super speed. So we tried it out in Showcase. It was a very big success, but we weren't sure. That was in Showcase number four. A uh, magazine, I believe, sold for a dime in those days. Now, if you have what is called a mint copy, it could be thousands of dollars, maybe as much, maybe between ten and twenty thousand dollars. The magazine was ready to go to press, except one thing had to be solved: determined what number would be put on that magazine. Would it be issue number one, 
or would it be issue 105 because the previous flash had run through 104 issues. So I went into the uh, publisher and I said, what shall we call the flash? Number one and number 105. Well, nowadays the answer would be simple. It would be issue number one because issue number one is the one magazine that sells and follow-up issues do not sell as well. Well, strangely enough, he said, well, it's a simple. We'll call it issue 105. So I didn't understand. I said, why don't we call it issue number one? So he said, yeah. <laughs> magazines today are sold on a newsstand. And there may be hundreds lined up before a prospective buyer. Now, if that prospective buyer sees the magazine issue number one or issue 105, what is he going to buy? And the answer is issue 105. Because that issue, that magazine is so good, it's lasted for 105 issues. But magazine number one, who heard anything about it? Not all comic book collectors are individuals. Michigan State University in East Lansing has been gathering comics since the 1970s. With 80,000 issues in its stacks, it is one of the largest non-private collections in the world. This vast collection has been generated through donations from publishers and private individuals. Here, librarian Randy Scott and doctoral student Peter Coogan receive a shipment of 15 boxes of comics, the collection of a recently deceased Michigan State University alumnus. Peter Coogan talks about what a comic book is. According to Scott McCloud, who just published a book called Understanding Comics, which is the, the poetics of comics, as it were, he defines comics as sequential art, uh, combinations of uh, visual and other images in deliberate sequence. So a comic book would be a collection of these. This is something that's American um, because in other countries they take different forms. So the specific comic books that we have, that we have over there in the collection, um, are, are a major significant part of American culture. And I think that our collection here says that they're being recognized as such. The study of comic books as popular culture has gained wide acceptance in academia. Conferences on popular culture, including the study of comic books, are commonplace. This is more or less this particular paper, given by Dan Shoemaker of Bowling Green yeah, State University, looks at the personality of the comic book hero, Spider-Man. Created by Stan Lee and Steve Ditko in 1962, Spider-Man is one of the most popular comic book heroes ever created. Stan Lee talks about how he got the idea for Spider-Man. There had been a, a pulp magazine a million years ago. I read it when I was 10 years old, and it was called The Spider. And underneath it, there was the, I think there was a tagline, Master of Men. Well, when you're a 10-year-old kid and you read The Spider, Master of Men, uh, that, that name always stuck with me. And um, he was just a detective who nobody knew who he was. I think, I'm not sure, he wore a Spider-Man ring, a, spy, a ring with the imprint of a spider. And when he punched somebody, it would leave a little mark of a spider. That was it. So when I was looking for a name, I thought I wanted a guy who could crawl on walls like an insect. However, I got the idea. I don't know. And I was looking for a name for him. So I figured, well, Mosquito Man, nah, that doesn't sound dramatic. Insect Man, yeah, Spider-Man. And then I remembered that old pulp book and how much the name had impressed me. And I figured, hey, why? Uh, first I thought of the spider. And then I thought, nah, I think spy, I didn't, I hate taking anything somebody else did, even though it was a name from a million years ago. Then I thought, why not Spider-Man? Then I got a, and I love that. I, I became afraid it would sound like Superman. So that's why I put the hyphen in it between the spider and the man. So it wouldn't look the same. And it drives me crazy today so many people write it without the hyphen, and I find that very upsetting. What we know today as the comic book made its first appearance in 1933. Funnies on Parade was a collection of Sunday newspaper funnies compiled by Max Gaines to be used as a giveaway premium by the Procter & Gamble Company. It was such a success that Max repeated the enterprise in 1934 calling the comic book Famous Funnies, which sold for a dime on the newsstand. Years later, it would be Max's son 
William Gaines, who would revolutionize comic books through his publishing company, DC Comics, and subsequently, Mad Magazine. In 1937, Hope publisher Harry Donenfeld took control of Nicholson Publishing and made history. He launched Detective Comics. Drawing from the comic book's initials, the company would come to be called DC Comics and would retain that name forever. That first issue was edited by Vincent Sullivan, who also drew the cover. The following year, it would be Sullivan who would introduce to the world a comic character and a comic book that would launch what would come to be known as the Golden Age of Comics. In June 1938, Action Comics number one appeared, and Superman was born. Created by Joe Schuster and Jerry Siegel, Superman was an instant success, appearing in his own comic in 1939. Sullivan introduced still another famous character in Detective Comics number 27, Batman, the Cape Crusader. Superheroes flourished at DC Comics. Max Gaines collaborated with DC to introduce All-Star Comics in 1940, creating such legendary characters as Flash, Hawkman, Green Lantern, and Wonder Woman. The success of DC spawned a host of competing publishers. Most notable was the introduction of Captain Marvel in Wiz Comics, produced by Fawcett Publications. So similar was Captain Marvel to Superman that DC Comics promptly sued Fawcett for infringement of copyright. The case dragged on for years until 1953 when Fawcett finally ceased publication by killing off Captain Marvel. Comic books flourished during the 1940s. Publishers commonly printed copies numbering in the millions. In addition to the superheroes, other genres were popular. Science fiction, adventure, romance, westerns, the funny animals of Disney, Warner Brothers, MGM, and other film studios, Archie Comics, classic comics. The variety was endless. In the late 1940s and early 50s, comic books were perhaps the most popular medium of entertainment for the adolescents of America. But comics were not just for children. Adults were buying them too. Publishers were developing a more mature theme in their comics, most notably Lev Gleason and William Gaines, publisher of EC Comics. Gaines had been thrust into management of his father's publishing company when the elder Gaines died tragically in a boating accident. Working with his editors, Albert Feldstein and Harvey Kurtzman, Gaines would assemble a pool of talent unlike the comics industry had seen before or since. EC Comics would influence the way comics are produced for decades. Roger Hill, comics historian, talks about the artists and artistic style at EC. These are some of the finest comics ever written, ever illustrated, ever published in, in the history of, of comic books in America. So they're very important, and they introduce trends that uh, others follow. Here's a, a story published in Weird Fantasy or Weird Science uh, called A Mistake in Multiplication by Joe Orlando. This is unique in that it's Joe's first story for EC Comics. This is the one that really, his first story, and you can tell it because the man got so carried away with intricate detail on this story. He just did a fantastic job. And it shows. Now here's a story. Special emphasis on this one. Hugh Rocket. It's by an artist named Wood. And he signed, he usually signs his signature in an old English type uh, lettering. This man could draw spaceships with a claustrophobic effect. You know what I mean? Everything is so packed into that panel. <laughs> that it, you know, it doesn't leave much space for someone to breathe. He had such great perspective on anything he designed and drew for the comics, and uh, it, his his lightness balanced against his dark uh, blacks in there was always so well done. And uh, and notice how he also used this little uh, sipitone right here 
This is a shading screen that a lot of artists use for kind of a quick way to get a gray element into a black and white comic story, and uh, which kind of softened the edge of it. Wallywood is considered just about the, the best talented man that ever drew science fiction. And right up there with him is this fellow here, which is Al Williamson. This here is the splash page. The first page of any, any comic book story is referred to as the splash page. And that's because it had a large splash panel, you know, which kind of grabbed the reader's attention right away. And what they would do is there were two chemicals which they would actually apply with a brush, which would bring out, once they applied the chemical on this specially treated paper, it would bring out a line pattern going one way, and there was another line pattern going the other direction. So by using that, by using either one or both chemicals, you could get two grades of shadows or shading. And uh, so it worked very well up here for a lighter shading technique versus down here for the darker shadows that the artist tried to put in there. It was almost as if somehow by some magical uh, condition, uh, all the great artists uh, of the 50s were assembled under one roof and work together in the same set of studios. Uh, it's almost a miracle when you look back at the kind of work they were putting out for, from 1950 to 1955. In the early 1950s, American society was entering the Cold War. All kinds of entertainment media were attacked as agents of communism and juvenile corruption. Comic books were no exception. In the early 1950s, the Ladies' Home Journal was printing excerpts of a book by psychiatrist Dr. Frederick Wortham. Wortham's book, Seduction of the Innocent, was an indictment of all comic books. It was Wortham's position that comic books which depicted scenes of horror, murder, and seductively clad women in jeopardy were adversely affecting the youth of America. Citing examples from specific comic books, mostly EC titles, and taken out of context, Wortham made a case that the medium had gone too far in its portrayal of crimes of murder and mayhem. In 1954, the Senate Subcommittee on Crime and Juvenile Delinquency held hearings in an effort to determine if comic books had a detrimental effect on America's youth. Wortham's prime target, EC Comics, was mercilessly depicted as the villain. Roger Hill, comic book historian, cites an example of EC Comics artwork referred to in the hearings. And it uh, turned out to be one of the goriest stories ever drawn for American comics. It's a story titled Foul Play. It's a baseball gag story by Jack Davis. It involved a player on this team here. And anyway, this player was a really rotten guy. You know, The gist of the story is, is they dismember this man and they use his head for a baseball, a leg for a bat. Uh, the umpire is brushing off the home plate up here with a scalp. This was one of the extreme examples that this doctor went on to cite when he uh, wrote his book titled Seduction of the Innocent. It was a prime example of how comic publishers could get carried away. The artist of foul play, Jack Davis, went on to become one of America's leading popular illustrators, famous for drawing many covers of TV Guide magazine. EC's publisher, William Gaines, volunteered to appear before the committee to defend comic books and the comics industry, something few other publishers were willing to do. My name is William Gaines, and I am the publisher of the Entertaining Comics Group. I was the first publisher in these United States to publish horror comics. I'm responsible. I started them. It would be just as difficult to explain the harmless thrill of a horror story to a Dr. Wisdom as it would be to explain the sublimity of love to a frigid old maid. What are we afraid of? Are we afraid of our own children? Do we forget that they are citizens too and entitled to the essential freedom to read? Or do we think our children so evil, so vicious, so simple-minded that it takes but a comic magazine story of murder to set them to murder? of robbery to set them to robbery. The results of the hearings were inconclusive, but the effects were clear. Publishing companies got out of the comic book industry en masse. 
the few who remained established a self-censoring board that would regulate what could and could not be depicted in comics. The Comics Code Authority was established. Among its many rules, specific use of such words as horror, terror, and crime in comic titles was banned. EC Comics was to be the scapegoat. Games ceased publication of the most creative line of comics in history. In order to avoid the code authority, Games changed Mad Comics to Mad Magazine, and Mad continues today, nearly 40 years later, as one of the most popular satire magazines in the country. Not all publishers subscribe to the code. The Gilberton Company's line of classic comics were the best example of how comic books could be elevated to the level of classic literature. Although generally frowned on by English teachers, the Classics Illustrated series nonetheless introduced generations of adolescents to the great works of literature, which they probably would not have read otherwise. Another line of comics which did not subscribe to the code was Dell Comics. Known for featuring humorous, funny character types of stories, Dell Comics had their own pledge to parents to eliminate entirely objectionable material. Dell Comics are good comics, was their credo and constant goal. Dell Comics invested heavily into the movie studio's cartoon characters. Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck from Warner Brothers. Tom and Jerry from MGM. Yogi Bear and Huckleberry Hound from Hanna-Barbera. Woody Woodpecker and Oswald the Rabbit from Walter Lance and Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck from Walt Disney. The Walt Disney comic characters were many and varied. Possibly the most popular title in the Dell line was the long-running series, Walt Disney's Comics and Stories. Started in 1940 as a collection of Donald Duck comic strips, it developed into a showcase of the talents of one man who would create literally hundreds of Donald Duck stories over three decades that would elevate the medium to a level of fine art and great literature. That man was Carl Barks. 30, Being sold as an oil painting depicting five ducks playing in a pile of gold and jewels. The painting is by Carl Barks. Ninety-two years old, Barks still works every day in his studio in Southern Oregon. He is completing another in a long series of oil paintings depicting the Disney Ducks. This painting will be a limited seriograph for the Walt Disney Company. Because few original works published by Walt Disney were ever signed by the artist, Barks worked in obscurity. Creating such characters as Scrooge McDuck, the world's richest duck, Gladstone Gander, Donald's lucky cousin, and Gyro Gearloose, the wacky inventor. Barks developed the Donald Duck of the motion picture cartoons from a one-dimensional farm animal into a multifaceted, complex personality. Known to generations of readers as only the good duck artist, it was not until after his retirement in 1967 that Carl Barks finally received the recognition due him for his contribution to comic books and popular American culture. Carl Barks talks about how he got his first job as an artist. I have been just always trying to learn how to draw and uh, studying the way uh, drawings are always related to an idea of some kind. And I 
was working at that time in the railroad car shops on the riveting gang, and I wanted to get away from that terribly hard work very much. And I got to uh, looking at these joke magazines and decided that perhaps I could illustrate something that I could sell to a joke magazine. So I tried it, and I sold a little drawing. They didn't use the joke that went with the drawing, but they <laughs> printed the drawing. In 1929, I think I sold the first drawing. In 1931, they offered me a job to go back there and work. 1942, set up a way of raising some chickens to make a living, and I was hoping that I could... Uh, get on with comic books. Western publishing came there and uh, trying to find something that they could use in the way of a duck story or an adventure story using the Disney characters that uh, would make a big full-size comic book or a long story. The animated Donald back in those days was a squatty guy seemed to have really rubbery legs and I couldn't uh, seem to get the kind of action I needed. I needed a Donald who could walk like a human. I found that uh, I was very limited if I stayed with just the one Donald who was a squawky, fighty guy. I had to have a Donald who could do some thinking. 1948 when I was asked to do a Christmas story. So I invented a character named Scrooge, Uncle Scrooge, he was just Donald's rich uncle. He had money and it's there for you to look at and see and just imagine how much that would weigh and how much pleasure it must give him to dive around in it. I think I created something that is a little bit of a uh, something most people would like to do. <laughs> I never figured I'd ever have any more use for him than just that one story, but he worked out all right. It was the Uncle Scrooge adventures that established Carl Barks' place in comic book history, elevating him to the level of cult hero to many. I don't feel that I have the personality to uh, the occult hero. I would like to be remembered as a guy who did a good job. A publisher who is making sure that the works of Karl Barks are again available to the public is Bruce Hamilton of Gladstone Publications. Nestled away in Prescott, Arizona, Gladstone Publications has been reviving the classic Disney line of comics since 1986. Bruce Hamilton talks about Carl Barks. He wrote about the human condition. There's nothing that ever happens to anybody that you can't identify and say, yeah, I remember something like that happening to me. Or when it happens to Donald Duck or Uncle Scrooge, you laugh because you realize that it's so true to life. And uh, yet they're just ducks. When Donald Duck was rationalizing about returning a reward that he had unjustly and and incorrectly gotten. He was standing around and going through all of the mannerisms that a person would do if they were rationalizing. Carl didn't say, now here is Donald Duck rationalizing why he's going to keep that money. But you could see as it went from panel to panel that that's exactly where he was heading and that's exactly what he was going to do is he was going to keep that reward because he was figuring out in his own mind why he could justify it. And it's this basic understanding of human nature that Carl had what that is, is genius. Not content to just reprint back issues, the artists at Gladstone are actually improving on the original artwork. Uh, taking, out, taking out any black that's not supposed to be there or uh, covering any white that's not supposed to be there, and then it'll be shrunk back down. So we are creating our color guides on Xeroxes of the line art. Start out with a black and white page like this one, and then I use what are called Dr. Martin's dies, which are 
uh, pre-mixed watercolors. Some people use colored pencils, uh, some people will use markers. Um, it really doesn't matter as long as the color comes close to what you want. Uh, this is an example of a finished page of color. It hasn't been marked up yet. This is an example. This isn't a story I did. One of our freelancers did this. But this is an example of a page that has been marked up for the color separator. And they've gone in and drawn a line to the various areas and told the separator what color that is supposed to be, broken down into percentages of 10. This is an example of one of our older comic books. And this at top is an example of our new album series. Now, as you can see, it's the same story. This shows how poor the technology was then as compared to now in terms of printing, both in color separation and in printing processes. This was done on letterpress, which involves inking a plate that actually presses the ink into the surface of the paper. This is done in offset. It gives you much crisper, cleaner liner. So overall, we're getting an opportunity now with the new albums to present Burks' artwork in a much, much more flattering light before it always been colored up, covered up by clunky color like this is a master at creating backgrounds and believable compositions and layouts. We think this new series is a nice combination between the two because the line art isn't completely obliterated by the color. The color complements the art rather than overpower it, which is what we're really trying to go for. Perhaps the single most popular artist in comics history is Jack Kirby. In partnership with Joe Simon, Kirby created Captain America in 1940. Working with DC Comics in the 1950s, Jack created the Challengers of the Unknown. However, it was in the early 1960s that Jack Kirby made his major mark in comic books. Working with Stan Lee, Kirby ushered in the Marvel Age of Comics with the Fantastic Four, the Incredible Hulk, and the Mighty Thor. Kirby also had a hand in the creation of Spider-Man, the X-Men, and Sergeant Fury. Jack was about the best. He he was really a, a, a the most creative artist of all because he was more than an artist. He I, I call him a great conceptualizer. He could conceive of stories and follow them through. All I would have to do with Jack is give him a very brief outline of what to do, and he would just do the whole story. And after a while. When we were rushed, I didn't even give him an outline. He'd just do whatever story he wanted, and I'd come back and put in the copy. Jack Kirby um, broke all the rules in 1941 and 42. Uh, he, his style was so radically different than everything that came before it, and so exciting and so different that uh, suddenly almost everybody in the industry was looking to see what Kirby did this month so they could copy and swipe panels. Uh, he also was an incredibly fast artist, and he had great integrity. Everything he did was his best. He never did less than his best. For superhero comic books, Jack Kirby is still the guy that, that in, in terms, it probably influenced me more than anybody else, although you could show my book to a kid and they would say, no way. And, I'm, and, and the thing that people miss is, I'm not, I'm not influenced by him by his squiggly knee. I'm not influenced by his square jaw. I'm influenced by when you read a Jack Kirby book, you went, wow. And you turn pages and they went, wow. We spoke with Jack Kirby at the San Diego Comic Con about his work on Captain America. Well, my first work with Captain America was a pleasure. Oh, sorry. It was a patriotic and very terrible time. I have a copy of that. Uh, I'm thoroughly American. That's the way I always thought I was. So, um, all my stories episodes had a certain enthusiasm, which helped sell the magazine. Jack tells why he has worked in comic books all his life. Bob Nancy, a lot of people love performing. Yes, and the other way, why do people become proficient in business? Because they like that sort of thing. I don't think people ever do anything that they don't like. They stick to that job, they do something for you, and they get promoted. They get promoted. And that's in essence. What happened to me? Yeah. I like throwing comics, and I got promoted.
The early 1990s saw a rebirth of the comic book industry, not seen since the 1940s. In an industry dominated by Marvel and DC Comics, independent publishers have proliferated. Majestic, Malibu, Image, Dagger, and Dark Horse are just some of the new publishers who are garnering a significant market share of comic readers. Many of these publishing companies have been started by former editors, artists, and writers at Marvel and DC. Jim Shooter, publisher of Defiant Comics, tells how he got started in the industry. When you're, when you're 13 years old, you can't get a job in a factory. So, you, you know, I, I started uh, thinking creatively about how I could earn money. And I uh, was a big comics fan and thought, I could do this. So I wrote a script and I sent it to DC Comics. And uh, it was a Superboy script. And uh, everybody but me was surprised when I got a check in the mail, you know. And I, I said, yeah, I, I meant that, you know. And, and, uh, and they, they, they kept using me, and I worked my way through high school working for DC Comics. Image Comics publishes the most popular comic book in 1993, Spawn. Created by Todd McFarlane, Spawn is the perfect example of the artistic revolution comic books have undergone in the 1990s. In many cases, the art is actually more important, more dynamic, more alive than the story itself. There will be huge blocks of page after page, panel after panel, which there's no dialogue whatsoever, but that these very, very interesting, almost visceral stories are told. And although in some cases the art might be viewed as primitive, certainly it has made a, a mental connection with young readers all across the country and is extremely popular. There's more experimentation going on than ever before more exciting stylistic experiments, more people who have no pre preconceived notions about comics. They're willing to take a chance and do something radically different. And that's, that can be very refreshing. In a kind of an odd way, we've come full circle, because actually that is the way early comic books were drawn to some degree. Slightly primitive uh, anatomies were uh, misshapen or malformed. They weren't accurate. And people still enjoyed it. Well, we've actually come back to that. Although he is worshipped by his millions of fans, Todd McFarlane has been somewhat a controversial figure in the comics industry. A writer, Peter David, who used to work with McFarlane, recently debated Todd. I love sweet freedom. I am Ladies and gentlemen, about the challenges of working in the comics industry. I would say the greatest personal challenge is, is trying to strive for success and straddling on being either too much of a young audience in your work or too much of an old audience. If you get, I find if you get a little bit too simple, then all of a sudden the people that are 16 to 18 have a tendency to go, wow, it's, you know, it's, it's just another superhero book and we won't look at it. If you get a little bit too sophisticated, not saying that I could, but if you do, then books like Sandman and stuff that are brilliant books have a tendency to turn off the 8 to 12 year old kids. So somewhere along the line I have to straddle that fence going, the storytelling has to be clear enough and there has to be enough good cool, cool concepts for the 12 year old, but I have to present it in a flashy, designy, graphic way with a bit of an edge so that the 18 and over crowd can still grab something from it and get a wide audience. I think that any mark that I've made is is the whole of what I've done is better than the individual parts. That 
there's a lot of people I think that out draw me, out write me, out 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 think me, out out pencil me, and do a lot of things. But I think when I put a package together, and the way that I use my personality to try and sell it, and the way that I market it, and the way that I try to buck the system a little bit, all those components somehow make people pay attention. And basically, all I'm looking for is to give people another option. That that the one thing that I am always striving for, that I always fight against against corporate America is that there's a beginning and there's an end, but I see that there's 20 paths to get there, and we've really only gone down two or three. And so every time somebody tries to take another path, I think that people start to pay attention. Again, the fear of the unknown, you get a lot of people that say, go, 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 and a lot of people that say, no, Todd, that's wrong. You shouldn't be bucking the system. Be a good little boy. So if, if I've made any mark, I don't, I don't think that it's so much now artistically. I think it's just in trying to stand up and have a passion for comic books and have a passion for your belief in the comic book system. Comic book collecting is the fastest growing hobby in America. A pioneer in comic collecting is Robert M. Overstreet. Since 1970, Overstreet Publications has been producing the Overstreet Comic Book Price Guide, considered by serious collectors as the definitive price guide. I was buying comic books through the mail and paying a premium price for them in the 50s. And then all through the 60s when Spider-Man appeared in 1962. And uh, Marvel got the uh, comic book market heated up with their new exciting titles. And it started the whole comic book movement in the 60s. And comic books were just on fire all through the 60s. Old comic books became uh, very valuable and highly sought after, and they were very rare. There, there was uh, not that much publicity, and many of the old-time collections were still in attics. And so comic books were very hard to come by all through the 60s. And uh, it was during this time that the need for a price guide was, became more and more evident. And uh, so in 1970, I published the price guide. I didn't know if it would ever happen, but I thought it would really be neat if there was a price guide on comic books that people eagerly awaited uh, publication every year, just like in the coin market in the 50s. And it's ironic that after all these years, uh, it has actually occurred. It's, it's a dream that has become true. In addition to the price guide, Overstreet Publications recently introduced the Overstreet Comic Book Rating Guide. What is the future of comic books? Well, I think comics as a literary form is at the crest of a great, tremendous uh, cultural future. I think we're, we're right behind us is a huge cultural force that's going to impel this medium on its own well into the future. We are the new literacy. The quality of the writing keeps improving. The artwork is fantastic. The books become more and more expensive. So many graphic novels are published. So many are done in hardcover. I would think one day it, it will not be the least bit unusual to walk into a, 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 a bookstore and to have the uh, where they have their list of bestsellers to have a comic title right right up there with all the others. Noted science fiction writer Harlan Ellison offers his assessment of the industry. But comics when I was a kid were my friends. Comics uh, kept me sane. Comics, uh, when I was interviewed by Time Magazine, they said, what were your influences as a writer? And I, of course, said Antoine de saint Zubaray and uh, uh, Céline and Mark Twain, of course, and Joseph Conrad. When in truth, it was comic books and pulp magazines and, uh, and movies and old-time radio. Uh, these were the things I grew up on, and uh, they were more than pop culture to me. They were the real world. I still collect. I still collect. We built a, a special archive in my house. Humidity controlled, temperature controlled, floor to ceiling rolling bookcases, stack bookcases on tracks, uh, seven feet high, 12 feet long, uh, one aisle. We've got, uh, I have maybe a million, two million dollars worth of comics in there. Collecting becomes a madness and a sickness. I mean, I'm a collector. Uh, David Lapham just gave me the back cover for the Plasm Binder, uh, which I've been hunting for. And uh, now, see, here's a, this is a good book. This is, I love to see one of my books in this condition. I love it because it's all ratty and, and lunched, and, and, and it means somebody read it and loved it. The Fairfax County Public Library, and this woman just stole it from the library. 
That's okay. That's cool too. It's an industry that has been based on uh, transigence and, and transitory need. Here today and gone tomorrow, you throw it out. Your mother threw this crap out. That's what it was all about. So it couldn't be worth anything. So artists were always made to feel that they were insignificant, that what they did was, was unimportant. No one ever said that you were producing American literature. You are producing a Native American art form, something that has intrinsic worth because it is one of a kind. The rest of the world imitates it and lauds it and honors it. There isn't a person of our age in America that didn't in some way get shaped by reading comic books. And we have to remember that. Are comic books different today than they were in the 1940s? Yes. Like they were different in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Are they better? That depends on who you ask. It's a safe bet that comic books will be around for a long time to come. As long as there are people with the ability to read, the ability to think, and the ability to dream. to school nobody notices he has the bruises underneath his clothes his mom don't ask he won't tell all his friends don't know him oh so well Nobody knows that he's breaking. Nobody knows where he's been. Everybody says that he's broken, but I think he's just dead. Ooh, dare to be different. She walks a class with a hoodie on. Behind the mask, she's one so long. The teacher don't hear of the rumors spread or the notebook saying. How I wish I was dead Who will care that she's breaking? Who will care where she's been? Everybody says that she's broken But I think she's just mad 
Someone look into their eyes, maybe you will see that everyone is how they're meant to be. It's time for us to care that they're breaking, it's time for us to care where they've been. You might say that we're broken, but I think we're a little bit. You dare to be different. You dare to be different. Welcome to California Bountiful. I'm your host, Tracy Sellers. And today we're in one of my favorite cities, San Diego. We're going to show you some of the sights and the sounds of one of the most beautiful cities in the country, if not the world. But before all that, let's get to our first story. There's just nothing like the smell of a warm pie baking in the oven to conjure up fun childhood memories of home cooking. Whether it's apple, cherry, or peach, the all-American fruit pie has evolved into the most traditional of desserts. The average American now eats six slices of pie a year. And these days, what says good old-fashioned fun more than a pie just like mom used to make? But how do you make fresh fruit pies that are just a little bit better than the ones that mom makes? Well, one way is to grow your own fruit. Let's see. Oh, this one. Keta's store started about 50 years ago. My parents were farmers, and as being farmers, they decided to bypass the middleman and start farm doing a farm store. Originally started as a way to use up all of their orchard fruit, the Akita's fruit stand has evolved into this, a fruit emporium for travelers and locals alike. Just off busy I-80 in Auburn, no doubt countless numbers of weary commuters have found comfort in Akita's special combination of fruit stand, country store, burger joint, and of course, pie shop. But despite its enormous popularity with folks, there's always one important question about the place. I just know it starts with an I, and there's a K in it, and an E, and an A. Akita? The I is pronounced E, and the E is pronounced E, and the A is pronounced A, so it's Ikedas. It's Akita or something. You can call me whatever you want, as long as you come in and grab the fruit and the pie and the burgers. We're happy to call us whatever you want to call us. One 
one thing customers have no problem pronouncing is their order for their favorite pie. Raspberry, Dutch apple, cherry cobbler, and peach are just a few of the mouth-watering flavors here, with everyone having their personal preference. Mary and Barry. I got a pie. I got a peach pie. Uh, we got peach pie here. So if you watch these guys filling the pies, I always tell them, put more in, put more in, not take less out. It's typical of making sure that all my customers are getting plenty of food in the pies. And it's that especially luscious, candy-like sweet food that is the cornerstone of this pie-making success story. Glenn still operates the same farm his parents did nearly a half century earlier, making it one of the oldest and largest in the predominantly urban area of Placer County. And they still depend on food that, like the land they farm, is reminiscent of a bygone era. You probably won't see these type of peaches and this fruit in the other stores like uh, the chains is because the chains need to be, the fruit needs to be firmer, they need to be bigger, they need to be colorful. For us it's all a matter of juicy, super sweet, and super flavorful. The look is second. Give it a try, Tracy. Okay. So we're, we're going to test a lot of food today. That's the one. Just like the heirloom fruit the Ikeda's family grows, fruit pies are nothing new under the sun. The first pies go back as far as the year 1303 when they were filled with meat and born of necessity to feed large crowds of people without much expense. Needless to say, it's a far cry from what we now know today as a favorite treat after dinner, which is exactly what has kept one California legend in business for more than four decades. And nowhere is the love for the all-American pastry more alive than here in Pescadero. That's because they've been making some of the best pies in the country for more than 40 years, and they've been doing it with a very special local ingredient. Voted an American classic by the James Beard Foundation, Duarte's Tavern is located in the tiny town of Pescadero. It's a place that has been satisfying locals and visitors since 1894. And today, it's the fourth generation clan that is serving up home cooked style meals to about 13,000 customers a month. But all is a far cry from what the place started out as. My grandfather, Duarte, was in San Francisco as a barber. And uh, uh, he came to Pescadero in 1894 and bought the business, which consisted of a saloon and a barber shop. After Prohibition ended, the family started the restaurant up again and eventually added an important item to the menu. Capitalizing on the rich agriculture around them, they began making and selling a pie made from a local fruit called an alali berry. First developed in 1949 by the USDA, the berry is a cross between a young berry, Logan berry, and a blackberry. And with its cool climate, Pescadero quickly became a hotbed for the fruit. The alala berry was bred for the coastal climate, not so much for the coolness, but for the fog. The fog would rot the average berry. These here berries are supposed to be black. While it's still a relatively small crop, the alala berry is a big hit among visitors to the Phipps Ranch. In addition to delighting the young and old, the farm also supplies Duarte with most of their berries used in their famous pies. The partnership between the farm...